for here to discuss uh, reimagining the IMF quota system for Africa. My name is Omar Ben Yedda. I'm the publisher of African Business Magazine and African Banker, which I've got a few copies here. The reason I'm facilitating this session is not for my expertise, it's because I share an office with uh, Hannah. She's a new tenant at our offices in London about two months ago. So uh, I was top of mind, obviously, uh, as I walked past her uh, one, <laughs> one afternoon. So uh, saying that, this conversation is not taking place in a vacuum. I believe at the end of last year, the IMF Board of Governors uh, decided that uh, we should have a um, we should look at the uh, the quota and voting shares, and uh, a new quota formula is re is requested by June 2025. So ultimately, we've got a uh, time defined uh, objective to meet. And uh, what a good friend of mine, uh, Carlos Lopez, once told me is that you don't get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, this is about putting together a common African position, uh, understanding what we want, uh, potentially understanding what the, uh, the pressure points are that we can, uh, that we can use, we need to partner with, and, uh, and what it is that we should, be, uh, we should be asking for. So I know very little about the, uh, the quota, quota system and quota reform. I know we've got a few people who used to be at the World Bank, IMF, uh, amongst us, and uh, some experts on the panel saying that if I was an alien coming to Earth, I'd say that uh, the IMF and World Bank, they're designed to assist development. But ultimately, uh, if you look at uh, how the quota system works and who gets the sh large share of the money, you see that it's actually going to uh, the countries that can print money, that, can, uh, that, that, that have other resources rather than the uh, IMF, which is supposed to be the, uh, the lender of last resort, whilst the developing countries haven't got access to those... Uh, similar facilities. One of the articles actually, so I started off my, uh, my career as a uh, full-blown capitalist and I started meeting people in the development world. And uh, so I started, so a friend of mine is Dr. Hippolyte Fofak. He's probably on the other extreme. He's just written an essay in our magazine, but basically the stat that he uh, put together in the terms of reform of the global financial architecture is that over 2020 and 2021, the US and uh, Europe combined probably injected $10 trillion whilst Africa had resource to uh, recourse to about 60 billion. So that tells you the uh, asymmetry in terms of uh, what people can do. And obviously the, uh, the IMF, et cetera, was set up uh, when the US was still following the gold standard. And when they saw a during, a surplus economy, uh, during a surplus time, and obviously they've, uh, they've changed that and uh, they can have access to funding whilst uh, the developing countries can't. So basically, so it's uh, an important discussion to have. And ultimately, as I said, I'd like to also explore some of the pressure points that we could potentially use. So we've had, for example, expansion of the BRICS, et cetera, et cetera. So what does that mean actually for the future of the IMF and in terms of our particular discussions as well? Uh, that's enough from, uh, from me. We'll go uh, straight into the, uh, into the panel discussion. Uh, so it's going to be panel discussion, Q&A. We've got people online, I believe. The, the team at uh, Boston University will manage the, uh, the online questions. What we want is we want an open discussion and obviously we want people to, uh, to come back, reflect and uh, disagree if, uh, in an agreeable manner, as they say. And, uh, but yes, but ultimately, yes, this is, this is a continuous reflection and we want to try and see where we're going to get to. And I believe that uh, the teams here will be uh, continuing this discussion as a, as a lead up to the next annual meetings in, uh, in, May, in, sorry, in October and then, uh, and then the agenda next year. So without further ado, maybe we start with uh, Lara, who's going to give us a little bit of the historical context uh, in terms of uh, quota reform, uh, where we're at, and, uh, and what, uh, what the trigger points are in terms of, uh, in terms of emerging countries being slightly uh, as effective of the current system in place. Okay, thank you. My name is Lara Merling. Um, thanks for coming here and joining us to hear about IMF quotas. Um, which is an issue that seems very technical, but it's very relevant. And you know, you said that the Bread and Woods institutions were set up when the gold standard was alive. They were also set up when colonialism was alive. And in terms of the quota structure and power structure, that's still the world order that they reflect um, and how they are built. And in the years since, there's been you know three changes to the quota formula. Uh, but those changes have been pretty small and done in a way that maintained the overall same power dynamics um, where, you know, we see these institutions where the U.S. has veto over major decisions, including the decision to make any changes where they would lose their own veto. 
um, where, you know, Africa, I looked this up and based on a paper I did, I found the statistics. These are from 2022, but it's like the 54 countries there have had um, over 20 years, 132 out of 275 IMF programs. So most of the IMF programs, yet they only have 5.2% uh, of quotas and 6.4% of votes. Um, and that matters a lot in terms of also the program design and everything else and having a voice or someone to hold accountable if you're not happy with your program or something goes wrong. And to this day, you know, the quotas determine the voting power. Um, they determine how much countries pay in. That was the initial idea of like the quota contributions. And then also when you borrow the cost of lending, because if you go over a certain amount of your quota and for countries that have small quotas, that's sort of the norm. Everyone goes over the threshold. They have to pay more fees. And those are uh, what's known as surcharges. Um, the quotas are also determining the distribution of special drawing rights allocations, which we've seen you know, a major win in 2021 was a 650 billion allocation of SDRs. Uh, but again, out of that, you know, for Africa, they got 5% of that because it's divided based on quota. Um, the way like the, you know, formula changes and discussions around quota reform are going is that for now, it's still like done in a way where any shifts in the formula are really matching political agreements rather than kind of having a genuine discussion of, you know, representation. Um, and I would also say that there's also the basic issue of like, why are quotas still determining the voting power? Because again, in other contexts, you know, if we look otherwise, it's very undemocratic to say that the richest people should have more votes. So why at you know, the IMF and Bretton Woods institutions, do we accept the idea that the richest countries should have more voting power than everyone else? So I think this is, you know, to start with and Thank you, excellent. So, uh, I mean, you did mention one thing, you said that uh, Africa benefited from, let's say, 50% of the uh, of the programs. But actually, if you look in absolute numbers, it's actually pretty small when you compare Argentina to, uh, they, they probably benefited as much as, uh, I don't like to break the continent down, but the rest of I also want to say something, I wouldn't use the word benefited. benefited. Yeah. <laughs> I actually would use the word, like, you know, they've had the programs to. and those programs have had, you know, the structural adjustment yeah. conditionality attached to them that hasn't really benefited African countries exactly because they have no say in the program design and how it's designed and any of that and like what type of conditions get imposed or if those conditions don't work they can't hold anyone accountable so i wouldn't say benefited no problem i'm from tunisia i can tell you that our president doesn't use the word benefited either <laughs> <laughs> so um okay so uh no, but ultimately in terms of absolute amount what they had recourse to was actually quite small compared to uh, compared to uh, compared to other countries um Hannah, maybe we'll uh, we'll go to you. We'll go to you. Ultimately, there's uh, there's been a, there's there've been a number of cases put forward in terms of how you should be recalculating the uh, the quota system using uh, PPP uh, as opposed to GDP uh, amounts. So, uh, and I think you've put you development reimagine has put together different methodologies. So, what are you guys suggesting in terms of uh, the quota system and how we should be recalculating it? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, thanks, uh, Omar, for moderating and um, to Boston University and Oxfam um, for your partnership bringing this together. Um, I think it is a very important conversation, obviously, um, and we do need to, and the reason being is that I do think that on many of these issues, we should be having, as, as Africans in particular, should be having publicly well understood positions um, on, on, on the reform questions and a whole set of other issues. And sometimes we do have public positions, but other times we don't. And I think this is an issue in which it's that it's so important um, that that should be well understood. Um, coming to your question, Omar, um, I think, again, having a position, we need to think about African interests at core and what Lara was mentioning in terms of the origination um, of IMF and World Bank, we know that uh, when the IMF and World Bank were created, 44 founding members, out of those there were four uh, that were African, two of those were um, effectively still protectorates, but uh, 
they had some degree of independence, Egypt and South Africa at the time, but as we know, um, they, they were still highly affected by British rule. Um, and what we've also seen over time is that those, the quotas of those original four African members have actually are even lower than uh, they were um, at that point. So while other countries have come in, and of course, you know, it, it, it makes sense for African countries, for those who are coming out of colonialism, um, Ambassador uh, Martin Kamani, um, Kenyan ambassador to the, to the UN, um, talked in one of the, um, in one of the last uh, discussions, especially at the beginning of, uh, of, of Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, he talked about how when we came out of colonialism, we took the decision to, you know, maintain borders and take things as they are. And I think we also took that decision with regards to the international institutions, um, IMF, World Bank, WTO, etc. And we've been really good members of those institutions, full stop. But at this point, it's 80 years of the Bretton Woods institutions, and we realize that they haven't necessarily worked for our interest. Uh, Omar, you mentioned they are, we've been able to access funds, but the, the amount of conditionality, also the volumes in general, we have some data that just came out today, um, which says that uh, African countries, we have taken out about 40% um, of lending um, in terms of numbers of loans that we've had to try to, to access uh, for, from, from the IMF, but in terms of value, overall value it's about 10 percent um, so we end up going over and over again to imf um, more so than other regions etc but that uh, brings with it a whole set of a uh, whole set of challenges and we're going back and forth in order for small amounts each time so the there is good reasoning a good basis for change and uh, what we've been doing in development reimagined is looking at uh, what these different formulas might be, um, but thinking about it not from the formula starting point, but more, well, what if a doubling of shares were to happen for Africa? What would happen to the rest of the world? And in a way, that's what others did when they created the institutions. You know, Britain argued for a larger share of uh, shareholding of the IMF and, and the bank when they, were, when they were created on the basis of its colonial um, uh, uh, of its population, colonial population. Um, France argued for a larger share on the basis of its, uh, its trade with, uh, with other countries, with the colonial, uh, with its colonies. So how do we try to, uh, if, if we're gonna ask for a doubling of shares, then we could have a doubling of shares. How could others adjust to deal with that? And then, um, what would that mean in terms of what kind of formula would actually fit? And there are ideas for different formulas that are out, that are out there that would fit uh, uh, in a doubling of shares, for instance. Um, but I think the first point is, what do, we, what do African countries actually want? And then we'll work out what formula should be adjusted. Mm. That's my suggestion, at least. So we're gonna get Hanan Morsi from the ECA who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about desired outcomes ultimately and how we get there. So from what I understand, uh, when, they, when this was set up, they looked at uh, the size of the economies, they looked at uh, trade, and they looked, they looked at population, more or less. So today, they also want to add externalities, so basically carbon emissions from 1944 to, uh, to today. So what is it that you're proposing? What else? We, and, and also, obviously, economies rather than by uh, actual size, but uh, purchasing power parity, uh, power parity. Yeah, well, to accommodate, let's say, something like a doubling of shares, you could for instance, incorporate aspects like climate vulnerability. You could incorporate general poverty um, statistics and the amount of and gen, and the inability of well, the need for countries to be able to to go to the IMF, for instance, um, which tends to be dictated by things with structural features like um, uh, issues around currency and exports and so on. So you would have a you would use those types of uh, elements. You wouldn't do this on the basis of economics you would do of, of economic power you would do it on the basis of need and recourse to use the imf as a lender of last resort mm. and so uh, one last question one last question before i go to my other panelists but from what i understand so the certain decisions require 85 percent uh, approval the yeah. united states has got over 17 percent uh, of the voting 
that means it's effectively got a veto. But do we have to start with the premise that we need to keep the veto for the US? Is that the is that the premise that of our negotiation that we're never they will always have a veto over the final decision, or, or are we going to be more ambitious than that? Well, I think it's for every member of the IMF to think about their own interest. So I'm not sure that African countries should be thinking about the interest of the US when they're making their decision. At the same time, um, of course, that needs to be factored in in terms of where will where will what is the real realism of this of this proposal. Um, I guess one of the key issues to think about is if organizations like the IMF and World Bank don't change, what does that mean for the future? Yes, countries might still try to access IMF and World Bank, and of course we will. But at the same time, there will be other options that we'll be trying to create. And so the institutions and those who are large shareholders of the institutions at this point in time do have this in effect a choice, either do you maintain the organizations as they are with things like veto, et cetera, or do you help them to evolve and therefore allow them to remain relevant and active? Otherwise they won't be active and they won't be relevant and there will be other options. And, and there are people who, we are working also as Africans on lots of different um, other options, including an African monetary fund itself. So that, that will come into play, but it's how does the IMF and the World Bank actually stay relevant in this context? Mm. So uh, I've been given a set of questions, but uh, of course, uh, as a bad student and a bad journalist, I don't like, really necessarily look, look at them beforehand, nor stick to them. But uh, Fatih, so uh, I'm going to deviate a little, if you don't mind. And anyone can answer any of the questions that I've asked others, if, you, uh, if, you've, got a, if you've got a comment. But ultimately, I mean, we're talking about the uh, IMF quota reform, but from your perspective, why does the IMF matter? And therefore, why does the IMF quota reform matter? Well, um, IMF and history, IMF and Africa's history go way back, as you as you know. Uh, I was a young girl in the late '90s, early 2000s, and this was the time of the um, structural adjustment programs. And uh, we still feel today the effect in African countries of these programs. We feel it in underfunded uh, public health, underfunded public education, and overall setbacks in terms of uh, social protection. Um, and our economy since then has not been able to achieve sustained growth. They have not been able to ramp up their tax systems um, because the tax systems are still uh, in favor of the rich and the powerful. Um, and broadly speaking, this is really the door by which neoliberalism have been imposed, has been imposed inside uh, uh, African minds and, uh, and economies. And this was really uh, uh, the making of the IMF. Um, we think that uh, we have learned lessons. So let's see if we can learn lessons from, uh, from these, uh, uh, from these uh, times. But when we fast forward a little bit, not to today, but to the Ebola uh, crisis um, and the inability of the countries that experienced Ebola outbreak to face the, the, the emerging uh, epidemic. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why they had such a challenge to face Ebola was because exactly this, the public health systems have been uh, not destroyed, but really uh, weakened by these adjustment, uh, structural adjustment uh, programs. Um, and if we fast forward to today, uh, Africa is the continent with the highest number of small IMF loans. Um, but uh, we know that there's more to come. So uh, again, fragmented, fragmented little loans by which IMF impose its con conditionalities to uh, have a bigger influence on public policies. So the IMF footprint on Africa is considerable, um, but we know that we have mentioned it already, uh, the place of Africa in the IMF governance and the weight of Africa in IMF governance is uh, uh, ridiculously small, 6.4% uh, of the voting rights. Um, and welcome, Hanan. Hello, hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi. 
Good afternoon. So we mentioned Lara, uh, 6.4% of the voting rights, um, only two executive directors uh, representing the whole continent. Uh, there's a third one on its way, on their way, uh, but with no changes in the voting rights. So um, it's like Africa is a canvas and IMF is the painter. Takes a little bit of this color, add a little bit of that color, rinse, repeat, correct as they wish. And Africa is the silent observer and we have no ability to uh, influence uh, the, the outcome. And this is 6.4%. Uh, representing 54 countries, um, when USA alone have 16 or 17 percent, it's 6.4 percent of voting rights on a continent that is home of uh, 17 percent of the world population. Um, so we feel that this is not uh, this is not equitable, this is not right, and we welcome the idea of a, a deep and uh, impactful reform of the voting rights. Mm, okay, so you mentioned one thing, you said the, the Ebola crisis, and ultimately there's uh, something, it's also the speed of response. You need to be able to respond quickly, you need to be able to access, uh, access funding quickly. I know there's a whole discussion right now in terms of the loss and damage fund, which is going to be sort of, I don't know if it's administered is the right word, but anyway, hosted within the World Bank, but they actually want $150 million that they can disperse without having to go and uh, seeking approval from, uh, from others to be able to respond to disasters in a timely fashion. So, uh, so maybe we need to think also there may be some instruments within these institutions whereby you don't necessarily have to go to, uh, to, uh, to the board to be able to disperse. Maybe we need to think slightly differently in terms of the instruments and, and, and initiatives within the or programs within these institutions that allows for a bit more flexibility and therefore that overcomes the rightful veto i'm just putting this out there i've got no idea whether it's feasible or not or the right to veto the, the the right to veto because ultimately the veto comes with foreign policy will always trump development ultimately and i think that was the problem with the sdrs they didn't want certain countries to access sdr or they didn't want to the, the us had foreign policy di directives that uh, that meant that uh, the rechanneling of, of of sdrs wasn't uh, wasn't possible but anyway we've got uh, hannah morsi who's uh, Deputy Executive Director at the, uh, is, that, is that the right title? Yes, Executive, Executive Secretary, Secretary, Executive Secretary, sorry, at the uh, Economic Commission for Africa, who's, uh, who's working on the uh, reform of the global financial architecture. I believe that this is, uh, this is part of uh, what you're working on. So what does the landscape look like? What, what, are the, what is the desired outcome? What would you qualify as success? Thank you. Uh, be with you and apologies um, for coming. Uh, later because I was in a meeting and we have to leave a bit earlier, so apologies in advance. Uh, the issue of uh, COTA reform really relates to uh, two things. One is voice and representation and second is access to uh, finance because most of the um, you know uh, access limits uh, to various financing and instruments, for example, at the IMF, are linked to your quota. It's a percent of your quota. So basically, that quota determines what is your ceiling in terms of access to resources. Um, and second, of course, is uh, what it means in terms of your voting power, in terms of you know discussions and swaying um, you know decisions on key issues, particularly one that relates to you um, so uh, the you know the one of the things that we have been calling for is that the share of africa uh, in the you know whole quota is really small relative to as you said uh, uh, other like so for africa to have a share that is uh, uh, similar to germany while africa has 1.1 1. 1 billion population on germany like you know, 80 something million, just there is something that is not balanced. But I think there is, I think a very important thing that also we, uh, we don't take into account, which is, uh, and I, I've said that before, uh, that uh, most of the operational cost of the institution, for example, the IMF, 
come from the interest rate that countries get charged. Where does this come from? From countries that borrows. That means we have a, also a high share. So it reminds me what we used, you know, I used to live in Washington many years ago when you had the uh, DC cars that said taxation without representation. Mm. So it's exactly that case. It's you have your financing, the cost of operation, but yet you don't have a say on how things are run that is equivalent to your share. So I think there is something that is not balanced in that, um, that has to be fixed. Uh, but just to be very frank, I, I think part of the issue is, is not about the, the redistribution to low-income countries or African countries. Is not so much the bottleneck. The bottleneck is opening the file has geopolitical implication because it means China needs to get a bigger, a bigger share. And that's a bigger problem. It's not about the low-income countries, but yet we get, you know, we are in the middle of it all because I mean if it means that then you don't want it and this is why I think part of what happened last year uh, because we've been really pushing forward all the voices coordinated about it what happened before like two weeks before the, uh, the annual meetings in Marrakesh the statement by uh, Jay at uh, Glo Center for Global Development welcoming a general quota increase of 50% uh, and uh, an additional board seat. So it was a deal, you cannot say no because you're getting something. You're not getting what you're asking for, but you're getting something. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up is of course welcoming because 50% means increase in your access limits mm -hmm. of the financing that you can get. It doesn't um, address the your, you know, redistribution of how much more you should have, but it addresses that you get more. And in the current situation, we would not, we cannot say no, it's not optimal, but we cannot say no. So I think one of the things that we tried to, advo you know, to advocate for, uh, for in terms of, uh, for the ministers to take forward is that we say, we welcome this, that's great. But to say, uh, you know, conditional on for the next review that we need to look at this, that this need to be one of the items that are on the table. Uh, I'm not sure what is the innovation next time, well, you know, two weeks before, <laughs> but as of now, that's the target. And let's see how. Um, one of the things also that we, we said that need to be considered is how this, there's a formula for quotas. Mm -hmm. And the formula puts um, uh, emphasis on the economic size of the country, so bigger countries, get you know, bigger share and on their um, you know financial strength so the bigger better you are the more you get uh, so we, what we were suggesting is to have an element of vulnerability or exposure okay so that actually you know you get uh, resources also on that to adjust to include that um, it's not going this is not just to be very uh, Frank, this is not an easy one, but uh, an easy battle, but this is one that is really important to focus on going forward. Um, because uh, without it, you know, it's going to be marginal. There were other alternative uh, proposals, for example, mm -hmm. to have two structures. Like, you know, you have that your access does not get limited to your vote. So you can have, you know, separate the two basically. But it's not a solution because at the end, it's, you know, your, your decision making uh, uh, power remains limited. All what you're given is money. So mm -hmm. I'd rather that we have say in both rather than just, you know, take the money and leave, you know, the, the, the voice and share in, in power making. Uh, I think that will be very important. Okay. And uh, you speak to a lot of uh, or different ministers of finance across uh, across the continent. I mean, is there uh, is there a common voice here? Are they engaged in this uh, in this debate? Are they uh, are they willing to uh, to put their foot forward? And uh, so, 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 what's the what's their position in terms of what's, what's the feedback that you're hearing? I think it, this is one of the areas that is actually um, you know. Um, a common ground for all African countries that they want to have higher voice, higher representation. 
I think the issue is not in so much on the African side, but on the other side, when, when, you, when you speak to some of the others, it's like, yes, of course, we'd love to have more votes and, and to give more quota for Africa, but we don't want to give it to X. Mm. So, I mean, when you have that, well, how, you know, there is a limitation to how can you design the system that gives you the two outcomes mm -hmm. and who will approve it. So it's a bit more like, I think, complex, but it's a very important issue because also it has implication for, um, uh, what is the right word? Uh, 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 basically like, uh, the integrity and the, the, the uh, relevance of the institution, meaning um, now we, we are in a world that is no longer the majority or the largest share is the G7 or even the um, you know, G20. Okay? We now have a world where emerging markets have taken the, the in share of global economy, the G7 in 2000, and have taken the G20 in 2008. So that kind of global new global order is not reflected in the boardroom. So you either going to you know, reflect that new reality or you will have end up with a parallel system that is developed and losing relevant of the institution, as simple as that. So I think it's really important to look at it realistically what it means because you don't want to have like you know a, a, a complete system that gets developed and basically they lose you know uh, relevance as the institutions that have been established uh, eight years ago. Mm. So in terms of uh, I mean I was at a talk with uh, that asset held a couple of days ago, and uh, again on the on the ASDR issue, they said that for example you have a country like France that may be uh, that may be favourable in terms of redistribution of SDR, but actually you can't. France can operate alone because actually the EU has to operate as a one. So the so we've got, we've got added complexities in terms of on that negotiating front. So what? So the African Union needs to go and negotiate with the EU to try and get the EU on side. What's uh, what's your take there in terms of uh, moving this uh, moving this process forward? I I, I think uh, the key thing is to insist that the redistribution of quotas have to be in you know uh, uh, integral part of that review. It's not about the level, like, you know, the kind of uh, quota. Do we need uh, to increase the quota in general? Or it's about redistribution. So it needs to be the focus of the coming review, OK? Because then it brings uh, the whole analysis, the whole assessment, the whole issue to the, to the table. It's not, uh, it's not that I'm saying it's like we can have it, this one. But the fact that we have the analysis and the discussion opens the window that we have not had. And it's an important one because it also uh, relates to how this new emerging you know, global economic powers are seeing this in, these institutions are relevant or not. So when you talk about, say, recapitalization of certain institutions, they say, yes, we're willing to put more to IDA. But if we are not going to give a fair share in, you know, in uh, the governance structure, why should we put the resources? So, I mean, there are fundamental issues. At the same time, the ones that want to maintain, you know, the, the uh, whether it's B2 power or the uh, uh, larger share of the voting, don't want to put the resources. You cannot have the cake and eat it too, is my, yeah. <laughs> is my yeah. kind of short answer. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I know you're laughing. <laughs> I hope uh, I hope we're not live. <laughs> we are live right? <laughs> online. So, but, but, but Jason, so uh, you've got maybe some ideas in terms of uh, how we can reform this, who will support it, who will oppose it, how we can get to, uh, to our desired outcomes, and uh, who do we need to bring on board and on side, and uh, who's prepared to forego that? So I believe that one of the biggest, uh, not the biggest beneficiaries, but the biggest losers from the current system is actually China. I mean, they should be having 10% uh, of the voting rights or so. They're only at around 6%. Yeah, um, thank you very much. And let me begin by appreciating uh, Development Reimagine, Boston University and Oxfam for hosting us. Um, I feel like a, little, like a fish out of water having listened to everybody so far. Um, because, so I think there are, there are many things here that we need to consider. 
uh, when we're talking about the quota reform uh, within the IMF, because it's not, it can't happen in isolation. Um, I think everybody has spoken about the importance of size of economy, uh, size of openness, I think, you know, in, in the background documents. But how do you use size of economy as a determinant for quota reform if um, African countries are not allowed to trade, industrialize, and grow their economies? Uh, and bring it to the table for negotiations. Um, you know, we've, you know, ev every speaker has agreed that we've been the recipients of significant amount of uh, support from uh, from the fund, uh, but none of that has been truly transformative uh, to move African economies from primary export commodity mm -hmm. commodity uh, countries to uh, industrialized finished goods, which would then, I think, logically give them a stronger negotiating hand. So in the current dispensation, I'm not sure there is a world in which uh, this reform actually benefits the continent because what it does, and uh, you'll excuse me for using this uh, analogy, it's, it's like diluting a drug for a drug addict, but still keeping them hooked to the drug, right? Uh, because that's exactly what's going to happen. I mean, we will get a, a marginal increase in our quarter reform, but we're still hooked to the IMF uh, conditionality, austerity, fiscal consolidation uh, programs, and, and the heavy conditions that, that uh, Lara has mentioned in, in her opening statement. So I think it's questionable uh, to, to where, to where the, the, the continent and the region would move uh, with this marginal increase in, in, in the quarter reform. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned there uh, as to whether this is really beneficial. Um, the third point really is about the, the, the biggest elephant in this negotiation room is the USA-China dynamic. Who is willing to give up those, uh, those percentage points? You know, are, are they willing to give up the, the veto? Most, most of us will agree, and I think it would be foolhardy for us to deny that there's no way on earth the US is going to give up its veto power in the IMF, and let alone to China. Right. I, I do think this, we should have a reality check and be very open and honest about that. Um, and, and therefore, in the new discussion, the new formulation of what this quarter reallocation might look like, uh, I'm not too sure, again, where Africa uh, falls into that equation, because what real decision or what real power will, will the continent have uh, with regard to the governance of the International Monetary Fund? And I think it's really important for us to have these, uh, this honest reflection. I, I, I do feel that we are trying to be very polite about how useful this conversation is going to be and, and how useful it's likely to be for the transformation of, of, of the continent. Um, I, I do think it's, it's, uh, it's an opportunity just to keep the hegemony of the IMF going and, and using Africa as the as the instrument uh, to prop it up uh, in this way as a counterweight to you know, any potential uh, uh, political uh, um, deadlock that may arise with, with China. So I think for me, these are, these are things that are very, they are complex, but at the same time, I think if we're talking about increasing Africa's voice, um, you know, perhaps we could borrow a leaf from uh, the Africa group and the group of uh, 77, uh, who up the railway line in New York did something a little bit more remarkable where they actually forced, uh, you know, within the United Nations General Assembly, a, a decision that is binding now to creating the, a framework on a tax convention in a more democratic way where each country has the equal, an equally weighted voice, um, unlike what's going to happen in, 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 in the IMF. So perhaps we need to start thinking of the alternatives Maybe the future of microeconomic stability, uh, surveillance, and, and governance does not lie within the IMF. I mean, uh, the MD, the UNSG have all confirmed publicly, it's on record, that these institutions don't work, are not fit for purpose. They were established during colonial times when many African countries were still colonies, and, and therefore they need to uh, in, in, in this present day and age are just not working for, for the continent. So I do think we need to be very um, 
honest, maybe pragmatic uh, about the conversation that we're having. You know, if we can't look at this reform in isolation if we don't fix uh, the trade architecture, if we cannot allow African countries to trade, to industrialize, to grow their economies, you, they cannot bring anything to the table other than, yes, we will do fiscal consolidation, we'll do austerity, and we'll let you come and, you know, dictate the rest of our macroeconomic stability for the next 80 years, and we'll keep saying, well, we need 0.1 percentage point extra, you know, and, and things like that. So I do, I do think we need to have a very clear idea that we're not trying to use the quarter reform to also prop up this institution that has not really benefited uh, the continent, you know, uh, throughout its existence. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I'm sorry for being, like I said, I do feel like a, a fish out of water. <laughs> I'm going to come back to my first question, which yeah. I didn't necessarily answer yet. But first, but I didn't introduce any of my panelists, actually. So Jason Braganza. <laughs> no, start there. Come <laughs> <laughs> Jason Braganza is the Executive Director of the Africa Forum and Network on Debt and Development. Next to him is uh, Fatin Z. Hassan, where she in her uh, in her office, Africa Director at Oxfam International, based in Nairobi. Next to her is uh, Miss Lara Merlin, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. Uh, Dr. Hanan Morsi, of introduced Deputy Executive Secretary and Chief Economist at uh, the ECA. And uh, Hannah Ryder, uh, co-host, CEO of Development Reimagined. Uh, but I'm going to go back to uh, you, Jason. Yep. Then I'm going to come back to you, Lara, in terms of other underrepresented countries, ultimately. It's not just about, about Africa. Also, we've also got the British Channel Initiative out there in terms of, uh, so we've got the, the, those island states and we've got other emerging markets that, uh, that have also got a say in terms of IMF reform. But uh, Jason, this is one of the questions I wanted to, to ask to you, but who is likely to support and who is likely to oppose this IMF uh, quota system? Is China, for example, the China, the, the um, China Development Bank, it's not called the China Development Bank, but it's China, is it China Development Bank? The CDBN is yeah. also China Exim. I mean, yeah. the, when you look at their balance sheets, I mean... Uh, China Development Bank is bigger than the World Bank. That's right, yeah. Yes. So they don't actually need uh, the IMF nor the World Bank. But uh, so, so, so who's likely to oppose it and who's likely to uh, support uh, African negotiations? I think, look, the, the, the political calculation here on any quarter reform is, is going to rely on whether the U.S., uh, is likely to lose its veto power. If any recalculation of, of, of the redistribution, of, it, it is going to rely on that. So any any attempt or any version of a of a of a new formula uh, will will be determined by that. And similarly with the European Union. And I think we need we need to be cognizant of this. Um, and the issue here is not whether Africa gains from this quarter reform. It's whether actually the U.S. and European lose and China. That is the biggest decision and, and the biggest political negotiation. So no matter what formula we use, the political calculation is scenario one, US loses by one, China gains by 0 0.5. That's probably not going to be a good thing. Scenario two, EU, US lose by two, China gains by 2.5. So that's what we're looking at. And that's why I'm saying the, the Africa part of this conversation you know, is, is really about making sure that China doesn't come up and US doesn't lose its veto. I, I think this is my, my, my perspective. I think this is the analysis that, I've, that I've, I've, I've seen. And I think this is where, I, to answer your question directly, that's what's likely to happen. Can I come? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, to just uh, give you the short answer of the question, both China and the US support Africa position. This is, the, this is the challenge. The challenge is both of them support. The issue is it's against each other. So we're in the middle. Just to put it simply, but, but so so what we've worked on is a formula, where or, mm. or rather a redistribution, not a formula. As I said, what we're thinking about is how you then use a use a redistribution and then find a formula that fits. Right. This is the, so. If you double African shares, the question is who then loses their share, and it doesn't have to be U.S. losing and China gaining. Actually. If you have, for instance, a redistribution within the G20, I mean, I know Africa is now part of G20, but of the other G20, if you have a redistribution within the G20, then in a, in a sense, everybody then loses. But those who have more lose a bit more. China still loses, in fact, but loses a bit less than the one who have. So there are ways of, mm -hmm. of trying to find a middle ground and if everybody loses but mm -hmm. Africa gains maybe mm -hmm. that's something which is negotiable. There is a bigger issue which is 
the quota system as it stands does not properly reflect uh, you know, the uh, appropriate quota for China. That's a bigger issue. They are underrepresented. So you cannot have a review of that redistribution. That's the whole issue of why the US has been avoiding the focus on redistribution in the review. Because the first one, the first winner, because they are have grown with the China, and then the other countries, you know, low, you know, low and middle income countries. So uh, China cannot, if it's done fairly, China cannot have a lower quota than what they have now. Mm -hmm. So, and that's if, if, the, if they accept it. No, no, no. It doesn't no, have to be. Uh, if China yeah. is doing that for the African continent, there is no reason why that has to be the case. That's all I'm saying. And but, the same with the other emerging countries. What I understand from what Dr. Hanan is saying is that the current existing formula is not even applied when it comes yeah. to China. Correct. So, yeah, so their right. starting point, yes, we know. Yeah. No. Their course. starting point for Indeed. any negotiation would be let's just apply the current formula and then we can discuss, and that would yeah. be unacceptable yeah, yeah, yeah. for the so US. So China would not accept. Okay, they support Africa, but they are not going to accept that their own share, which is not fair, gets lower to give to Africa. I mean, just you have, we have to be reasonable. For them, I mean, it means that for both them. And for Africa, maybe from their own increase, they can think about what to reallocate to us. But both for them and for us, there has to be an improvement. What does this mean? It means US and European Union, mm -hmm. they have to you right. know, lose no, some of these. But the, like, but the US share shares. would be more diluted. The European share would be more diluted yeah. than the Chinese share. That's, that's the point. It's mm -hmm. not, it is a relative shift still in the, in the overall account anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of I just wanted to say yeah, 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 I wanted to say something here also on like the formula and the underrepresentation. When looking at this and like why was there this discussion about a new formula with the quota thing is I looked at what happens when you update the variables, you know, by the IMF's calculation in the current formula. And it's like the US loses its veto and China almost catches up. And that was like how just seeing that it was like, oh, that's why the, the US now is saying new formula, because the formula that they thought you know it was supposedly fair like in 2008 when they agreed and it was a great formula is no longer like a good formula because no longer you know serves their interest and I think it's like also a reflection of how like the U.S. sees like the idea of the rules-based order it's like they came up with a rule it worked for them it was a rules-based whatever and now like the rule doesn't work and you know it's no longer like okay we need a new rule um and yeah like that's kind of how like seeing how like there's not going to be an agreement on a formula unless there's like a political agreement on how to redistribute. But the U.S. is at the point where I think like another background thing is the U.S. has about 17 percent, but only about 15 percent of votes, because the reason here is there is this basic agreement of like five point something percent of the votes are basic votes where it's like one country, one vote. And then the rest of the votes are distributed by quota. So the U.S. is right there, barely above like you know, having its veto. So, you know, they're not going to give it up. But then it's also like, who are they to like not give it up? It's like if they like are saying that they, you know, want a rules based order, it's like there should be pressure on, you know, them giving that up. So do the elections in November matter to some of the discussion? In some way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> domestically and in Washington, like they do matter, but it's not you know, sort of the level of discourse on anything mm -hmm. IMF related or like the SDRs oh, conversations in US like Congress are mm -hmm. like sort of at, at a level that would scare people, I think, abroad. And like they don't realize how absurd those conversations are and sort of like all about like geopolitical tension and nothing based in like facts or reality. Um, and like we see that like under all the different administrations and it just like gets worse or a little better. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're going to take some Q and A's in a second. Uh, I'm going to change the uh, the rules of the game. Paolo Gomez next to me is supposed to be making the closing remarks, but it'd be a wasted resource. We've also lost one of our panelists, uh, Dr. Dauda Semben, who was a IMF executive director. Paolo was uh, the youngest uh, executive director at the World Bank at the time. So maybe you you can talk to us a little bit about reform because you pushed through a few reforms in terms of uh, the African perspective. And how we should go about uh, reforming uh, or taking taking uh, taking part in these negotiations to push for the reforms that we uh, that we are seeking. Well, 
I think I will come a little bit with a contrarian view on this. Uh, and sorry about it. Um, because I think in life, there are things that you control and the things you don't control. And this thing on the IMF, um, and to give my background, I, I was executive director, I was the youngest in the history of the bank. I came, I was 34 years old. So I came with a very naive view of the world. In Fresh. The Fresh. Fresh. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the institution was set up after the Second World to serve a certain purpose. Let's be realistic, the, the US will not change it. There's no reason for them to change it. There's no reason. And I don't think also we are knocking the, the right door for this discussion. These things happen in the Congress of the US. And how, what is the pressure point on the Congress that I think as African, we should have looked at many years ago to see, because those are the people who have to talk to. It's not even Obama or Bush or others. It's the Congress. Um, and therefore we have given too much importance to that process over what we need to do as a homework ourselves. And I think it can be a very dangerous agenda because it suck all the air in the room in which you are wasting time on things for which you don't have control. So I believe in this process. There's a lot about, you mentioned about representation and the other one was uh, uh, access. Access. Mm -hmm. Voice and access. On representation, we form a team of executive director in the 90s, the end of 90s, to try to do this reform and we managed to get more shares um, or more uh, 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 representative in the board of the bank. But to be frank, when we managed to get that, our proposal was to the additional shares to be given to what I will call the African Union. So it, not, it will not stay within a country, a group of countries. I love my brothers from Nigeria, South Africa, and others, but that was not the initial agreement. And why was it important to put it under the framework of the AU? Is that you will have people sitting at the board without being pressured by the capital mm. about some of the view. It is very important because the German, the Japanese, the American have that. Everything is happening in the treasury. You have the executive director for the US sitting at the chair of the board, but the guy has received all the instruction from the treasury. The same thing with the Japanese. They don't even sleep when the board is taking it. There's a team in Japan sending information. So when we realized that as a board member, and there was an issue also among Africans, there was the Anglophone, the Arab countries, and the Francophone. And the Francophone executive director, before I came as an executive director, used to go and sit with the French executive director time to time to get some good instruction. <laughs> yeah, that was the reality. When we decided as Africans that we will consult ourselves before expressing our position, we start changing our position within the board. And also at the same time, there was a, a period where Wolfenson came from the private sector with a different view and he started to rock the board. And we formed an alliance with him. And obviously there was your network in order to push on debt relief because the issue of discussing about rescheduling the debt was taboo inside the bank. You cannot even mention uh, the issue of debt negotiation. You couldn't even dare to. Wolfenson had the courage to do that because he had also the network and he started penetrating not only the system of Wall Street, but also the Congress, the Senate, and the Congress to move the things. So I'm putting this as a context because I think those are the missing parts that we need to bring into our process of negotiation. And I will tell you, we will not escape a process of having one parallel track to cater to more realistic needs of our countries. I think there's a room for the IMF and the World Bank, but there's a new room for other institutions. 
And I, get, I can give you another example. When I left the bank, I joined Nigeria to set up, you know, I was asked to set up Africa Finance Corporation. And I went to do that because I was really convinced that there was a room for an IFC of Africa. And people were very skeptical. I spent three years, four years of my time working on that because I knew that this could be an example of doing a parallel institution that will not conflict with the World Bank. Mm. Africa Finance Corporation today is not a competitor of the bank. It's a, an additional institution that doing the thing with $12 billion balance sheet. So African cannot create similar institution to have two or three. What the African Exim Bank is doing today, it's a different type of institution providing liquidity. So I think it's important for us to continue to push this agenda, but there's a space for a parallel track, much smarter, that require having a homework of our own. I still a little bit disappointed that we didn't create an African Union share. This is not just a kind of a Pan-African discourse. It was an issue of having the best of us that we could send, because sometimes this thing is bureaucratic, it's political. If you send someone who's at the end of his career and two, two months from his retirement, he will not have the same motivation to defend the interests of the group of countries in the board. I think that was the advantage I had at that time because I was young and I was naive, but I was also passionate. So I was conspiring inside the institution because the discussion on voting, we never vote from our all eight years almost at the World Bank, we, all, we voted only once. It was actually an issue on the country uh, related to my group. And we had a shock with Paul Wolfowitz for two hours. So we had to go to the vote. But the majority of the case, there's no vote. We agree, we discuss, you go, you know, you seduce the, the, the American ED, you know, you take him to a coffee shop and then, you know, uh, the Chinese, same thing, you know, and this is how you'll be surprised how the ED can have a power to say, by the way, I support this project. And then you move. So I was long, but I wanted to kind of give that part of the thing. I, and I believe apart in the formula, we should ask uh, add the issue of environment, the climate as, you, as your vulnerability. There was the issue of so reserve. And the issue of reserve is not just the reserve that we have in the central bank as, as, as gold, but the reserve also that we have in our natural resources for which we can agree. Yeah. Obviously, Africa like to say we are rich. I mean, this thing of saying we are rich, and then the guy is sitting in a mud house, but he says rich. <laughs> no, I mean, there are things that we know that we have as, as, as asset that I think we should bring on board. And then I think this will disarm the, the, the debate and the negotiation because people are used to the classical negotiation, but the world has moved on a lot from the 80s and, and certainly from the post-war. We're going to take questions from the floor in one second. Uh, but I just want to, I mean, Paolo mentioned the process. Earlier on, uh, when we met uh, this morning, you mentioned the process in terms of getting Africa onto the, the G20. So, uh, and he, uh, Paolo mentioned Congress. I mean, is there a process, do you see a process, have you got a process in mind in terms of uh, getting to where you want to in terms of IMF voter reform, in terms of who we need to be lobbying and how we need to be uh, playing this card? I mean, I think Hanan probably has something to say about the process. Um, but it is, there's obviously a review um, that is upcoming. And uh, I think, of course, it would make sense to uh, do a lot of work within the US, but also China um, and, and elsewhere to build a position. But the first step is having a position. Um, and I think, you know, we're talking about the AU and the G20 process. What we had was a leader, a passionate leader at that point, who wanted to have a legacy in terms of the presidency of the African Union, Macky Sall, and he took this upon himself as something, you know, there'd been talk about it, you know, I'd written about it, lots of others had written about it, and that had meant that it, this was something which was really tangible and that they could put forward, but it was, it's a simple ask, but that's what I think, having a discussion around formulas and, you know, very specific, a simple ask, double our shares, and then we'll work out the, the, the rest of it. But having that, having a simple ask and having some leadership behind that on the African continent is going to be absolutely crucial. Fantastic. 
You want to add something? Or... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm just thinking whether I should, but okay. Uh, one thing that uh, I think um, uh, is important is also how this is um, like, you know, part of the discussion or who makes the decision at the end is, has been rightly said, is the US Congress. Uh, like how the decisions that have been like, you know, have gone through how, what, what was the most compelling argument? Can you, can you guess? Is what is the alternative? Okay, meaning who will come to fill that gap? So if you don't, you know, if you don't do that, what will happen? And we have been seeing this, by the way, like just to give you an, like a tangible example, um, you know, uh, for example, for Egypt, you know, there were something that they did which is very interesting. Uh, when there was really tough discussions about whether, you know, getting uh, um, uh, affordable finance from Bretton Woods institutions or from Europe or the US, they went and with guarantees from African institutions, with African Development Bank and uh, African Finance Corporation, uh, they managed to issue uh, for the first time ever a Banda uh, bond at an interest rate of less than 2%, okay? And a samurai bond for like, you know, 1.2%. So I think showing what this means in terms of the long term for that institution and that there are alternatives that will develop where they have no say about how things go is a useful way to actually advance that agenda. And, you know, because this is the only way like you can make all the logic but this is usually the winning one that gets listened to there. Can, can, I, can I just ask a complementary question to that, uh, Dr. Hanan? In this regard, what do you think about the BRICS Development Bank? Is it something that is seen as a credible alternative? Maybe not today, but in the near future? It's happening because we have this problem. Mm. Because we don't have a fair, like a like a fair governance system that reflect current realities. They, they feel like, you know, the emerging new powers feel that they are indeed, you know, underrepresented. So if the, the, the current institutions don't actually take action to correct that, you will see more of that and other alternatives. Mm. Uh, is it gonna, like, I think it's too early to say, but I mean, it's, you know, uh, uh, a new one that basically coming to fill that gap. Mm. I, I guess we need a bit more time to be able to judge. Mm. Uh, but all these, I mean, all these like, you know, arrangements, the, the bricks and the, the windows, the contingent uh, reserve windows that they have, the new development bank, the Asian infrastructure investment bank. So this is why we're saying like it's relevant. I mean, they either adapt or, you know, they are not going to be the same institutions that are on the helm of the mm. system. Mm. So I think there is like a benefit for both. I have to run, I'm so sorry. <laughs> as much as I would like to stay, um, but thank, thank you very much. Time. Thank you. So uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Dow the Senator just arrived. He's the CEO of AfriCatalyst and the former IMF Executive Director. We're gonna take a couple of questions and then maybe you can uh, come in, Potashi, even though yeah, can, you? can come and sit here. And maybe you should have come, but now. <laughs> 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 So when you ask the questions, you can pre please uh, press the uh, the button on the mic so it goes from red to green. We can hear you. So we'll start with uh, Mavis, whom I met a couple of days ago from uh, the Asset Think Tank. And then if you can please uh, let us know who the question is directed to. And then, but when you do ask the question, please let us know who you are and uh, which institution you represent, if any. Um, so, I'm from the National Center for Economic Transformation. I actually had four questions, which <laughs> has, was directed at different members of the audience. But when Paolo spoke, he dealt with most of my questions. But I'm still going to ask those questions. Um, so, as most of you know, I came in feeling a bit contentious this afternoon when I walked in here. So, I love your interventions, by the way. Normally, I'm kind of like balanced, but I felt like today you were spot on. So, 
the first one was Paolo's point. For me, when we talk about Africa quota, and sorry, Hannah, I haven't read it. I've literally skimmed it. It feels like Africa quota is 54 countries. So as Paolo said, how do we ensure that whatever quota system we get does not end up benefiting the big four or five in a way that does it, we don't end up getting this critical win only to lose out. So that for me was something that we need to think through when we think in, but we need to think about it now, it can't come later. So how do you deal with that? So that was the first one. The second one was, it's a geopolitical game. And again, Hanan referenced it. What is our geopolitical game right now? Okay. Hannah, as you said, we've been pushing for the AU for a long time. Okay. There's a very good reason they said yes now at the G20, AU at the G20. There's a very good reason they said yes now. Too many African countries said Ukraine is not our war, or actually we don't have to, you know, there's a lot of geopolitical games being played right now where it's time to have Africa at the table. So my question to the panel, and anyone can answer it, what is our geopolitical game right now? And how do we play that game strategically? Not just with the US, not just with China, not just with the EU, but with all three, so that when they go into the room, they realize that actually, if we wanna avoid the situation we are in right now with China, with Africa, we need to have the conversation now. And this is how we do it. So that was my second question. My third question was, when I skipped this, I felt that there was something missing. Very often, assessments of African economies are flawed. Okay, so when you look at rating agencies, how they assess our economies are flawed. When you look at how the World Bank, the IMF, etc., assess our economies are flawed. So in the rethinking of what is imagining of no pun intended of the quota calculation where is room for the restructuring of how our economies are currently calculated because i think somebody i can't remember who did the analysis but i've read in somebody's report where they were saying that african economies are underestimated as much as 30 to 40 percent by most of the global institutions and then my final question is a very naive one it tells you i don't know a lot about the imf but if we get the if we get a stronger voice through the quota system does that and this might be to you paolo as an xed does it give us a stronger position to hold the found a fund to account for bad practices so the reason i'm asking this was we are just about to put out mm -hmm. a paper in ghana 17 times the IMF. Okay. i was disgusted by the bad like you agree something, you shift the goal, Ghana shifts the goal. So the reason everybody talks about Ghana 17 times, it's actually not 17 times, it's four. Renegotiations is what got us to 17. But then you look at it and all the recommendations goes to what Ghana has to do right. But nobody ever talks about how bad the fund was in managing the relationship and the agreement with Ghana and what it actually cost Ghana with all the restructuring and the fees in the end. So where is, does that quote, an increasing quote to give us an opportunity to course correct some of those very, very bad behaviors of the fund or not? And I totally agree with everybody. We need a parallel system, but we're not there yet. So let's work with the devil we have whilst we're building, hopefully an alternative angel, which we know if this is life, but. That was my four questions. Sorry. I'm going to get Dowda to answer the last one, but first I'm going to get Lara, if you, if I may, to ask uh, to answer the one about uh, making sure that even within Africa it should benefit the big four. Ultimately, the fund should also benefit uh, some of the more needy and vulnerable countries. Well, that's where I think it goes back to like my initial point of like you know, voting power doesn't necessarily have to like be related to like the size of your economy, and that's like a very problematic. Yeah concept in other contexts that you know the rich get more power there's already like a number of basic votes like doing things like increasing those basic votes and the share of those would you know mean that like even within african countries any increase in power is distributed you know evenly and then doesn't replicate like you know the problem we have now globally for like within africa where like you have a couple of like big rich countries getting all the power 
But then if you use population, the big rich countries will still get it. Yeah, so, so not what are the alternatives? The, so the basic vote, it's kind of like the UN system. It's not population. It's okay. like one country, one vote. Yeah, fair enough. So now, right now, like within the IMF, like 5% of votes okay. are distributed that way. And the rest then go to the formula. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. So next time we'll only take one question per, uh, per speaking, even though this is more of an informal, uh, <laughs> an informal setting, because I'm very oh, bad at enforcing, as my 17-year-old daughter will tell you, I'm very bad at enforcing rules and regulations at home. She runs uh, right around me. But anyway, so in terms of uh, the geopolitics, maybe we go to uh, Jason and Fatty. Uh, Fatty, I'll start with you. I mean, you're involved in, uh, or Oxfam, your organization is involved in uh, many different issues. So you, you manage the geopolitics well, ultimately, in terms of uh, pushing the right pressure points. So are there any uh, geopolitics to be, uh, to be played here? And, uh, and if so, how? Um, I think we're putting ourselves in boxes, in pre-existing boxes, and just taking some of the rules that are human-made as, uh, uh, you know, cast in stone. Uh, we were discussing earlier the issue of, of, uh, of veto, as if, well, you know, if uh, the U.S. loses its 15% uh, veto, it will not agree to any solution. People have decided that the veto, there's, there's a veto, and the veto is 15%. Why are we still trying to walk around this issue of 15% veto? Uh, we heard about a very imaginative uh, solution that was uh, dropped. We don't know why. Maybe it's also the opportunity to pick it up. Um, the issue of one country, one vote, uh, applied to only 5%. Why does it have to be applied to only 5%? So I think there's many other things that we can consider within uh, the existing framework, which is also majority world countries, when they come together, they are over 15%. So this is within the current system. But we can also think outside, uh, outside the box and uh, come up with... Uh, but the best solution that is applied, that can be applied to the current uh, geopolitical uh, uh, dynamics. Because as uh, Hannah mentioned, we are just in the middle. Uh, they are fighting and we are just in the middle. We can't, we also need to be realistic about what we can and can't do. We can't make them budge. And it's also fair game that they're going to look at their own domestic interests first and foremost, but we can come up with uh, a little bit more courage and freshness and uh, strategic imagination together. Mm. Jason, you want to add to that? Yeah, um, maybe two points. I think I, I want to build on what uh, Paolo said about these parallel tracks, uh, particularly in the African Union context. Um, so African Union Summit this year, they launched something called the African Club, which is a group of eight mm. African uh, multilateral institutions. Um, there is a, a separate piece of work that's being done to try to uh, implement the Abuja Treaty, which calls for the establishment of certain African Union financial institutions like an African Central Bank, an African Monetary Fund, and so on, uh, which would help leverage the continent's uh, economic and uh, political um, muscle um, in, in the global economic system. So I think that's one... Uh, area that I think we should continue also focusing on because that, that in itself allows the continent or facilitates the continent to be more than just a, a rule taker, but a rule maker. Because once we have those established institutions, there's a coherent and coordinated uh, approach to some of, some of the work uh, and, and positions that they're likely to take. Um, I think the second piece of work uh, or the, you know, the second strand that we could potentially look at is genuinely what has happened in New York. Mm. I, I think mm. we should not mm. underestimate mm. how powerful mm. the Africa group and, and the group of 77 were in, in, in pushing through um, um, this, this resolution on, on, the, on the tax prevention. And not because it's going to change very much how uh, we, we look at, at, at uh, international tax, uh, taxation and international tax rules, but really from a sovereignty and an emancipation point of view that each country had a voice, had a single vote and was able to, you know, destroy, for lack of a better word, the hegemony that is held by, by, by wealthier countries. Um, and so I do think that there is a lot of value in us thinking through what 
the global economic governance of financial institutions look like when, when you have a single country having a single vote that's equally weighted. Um, there are things that can actually happen. Um, and I, I do think we should find a way as, as a community that wants to you know, uh, get Africa to be rule makers to, towards this sort of um, arrangement um, and this sort of dispensation um, with regard to the, the geopolitical uh, conversation that, that Mavis is referring to. I'm going, to, I'm going to get to you in one second. Uh, so, okay, so, sorry, did you want to say something, Tal? Uh, uh, okay, so we're going to get to you in two seconds now. That Mavis, I don't know if I got your question right. I know that you said the assessment of, of African economies, the assessment of African economies are flawed, i.e., that's why we have revaluations of economies in Nigeria, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But what was the actual question relating to? So, basically, so we can't use that as a measure because ultimately the calculation would be wrong if you're putting the wrong number in. Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yes, so could we use a better, a fairer calculation of the size of, the, the size of our economies when we look at the quota system? And if we do, would it benefit us or not? That was my question. So you can take that one if I get to okay. uh, Dawa then. Okay, so I think we could, and I think there's room in, in looking at that. I also think actually having a larger share in the IMF is a means to achieve that, mm. and part and plus plus representation on the board. Mm. The reason being is that obviously IMF is not just a lender of last resort; it's also a surveillor, mm -hmm. um, and it has specific surveillance systems um, which are applied differently and also create their own biases. Which we've we've got numbers on that um, with regards to things like debt distress and so on. And so, how do you affect those? You can only affect through decision making and if you are important and if we are more important as as an african group then perhaps we would have more say over being able to um, adjust that i'm not saying that's the only way um, but certainly i think the impact that the imf has on even what the credit rating agencies do and so on is is really outstanding mm. um, and so we have to really try to find a way to to deal with that and i don't think we do that by staying at five percent share I'm asking because Ichalma said that until we can, you know, fairly size our economies, okay, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about becomes very difficult at lots of different levels. So the question is, as part of this process, what kind of analysis can be done to contribute to that work? I doubt it. So uh, I think the last question was on bad practice and... Uh, Looking at, uh, but, but 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 I mean, I, I've got to say that uh, Abebe Selassie, Africa director of the IMF, is a friend, and uh, he'll he, he'll disagree that he'll say that we, we go with good intentions, ultimately, even though we know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. But uh, <laughs> it depends on where you it depends on where you ask him that question, yeah. and, and, and and that their approach is very different, different, different today than it was uh, 20 years ago. And actually, they feel that they're pretty proud of what they achieved in 2020 in terms of the... Uh... The, problem, the problem is that what, what, when you don't have a cost on asking things, then there's no cost for you. You keep asking. Okay? Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> anyway, Dauda, as an ex... Uh, as a former IMF executive director. Mm. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks for inviting me. And I'm sorry to have come late, I was in another event. Um, I don't know how many, how many, how much time we have, because this is a, such a big issue that uh, you cannot exhaust it in a few minutes. But let me give you actually some, um, some sort of um, insight based on my experience at the IMF. So I, uh, I was uh, privileged to represent 23 African countries, just the same one as uh, uh, Paolo was um, representing at the World Bank um, uh, and, um, until 2018. Um, and this issue, I think, is uh, really something that we sort of uh, struggle a lot with, the issue about fair representation and fair, you know, sort of voice of African countries uh, at the IMF. <clears throat> I mean, as the, you know, the concept not safe. Right now, we are at 5%. Um, and what the big issue is, first of all, we need to know when we talked about IMF quota reform, what are we trying to achieve? Because, uh, you know, when you're talking about reform, you want to, you know, you have some objective that you want to uh, achieve. And uh, in this case, for African countries, what, are we gonna, what do we want to do? Yes, we want to have more quota. Why? Because, of course, it's the metric that the IMF used to provide loans. And so, of course, the more you get, 
the more you actually have you know, uh, availability to IMF resources, that's one. You wanna have also more quota, why? Because also that's the metric that we use to measure the voting power of the country. And of course you wanna have a more say on that. But what happened is, as you all know, we are in a situation where until early 1960s, there were three uh, founding members, Ethiopia, Egypt, and of course, uh, the other one being Egypt. Uh -huh. Liberia, Liberia, Liberia and South Africa. Okay. I mean, in South Africa. And when the countries join, they, of course, find some rule of the game that they had to sort of comply with. So what are the rule of the games? So right now, the quotas of a country actually are determined based, we talked a lot about GDP, because GDP is the largest factor, the one that has the largest weight. But it's not the only one. So there are also other sort of um, um, uh, variables that are in the quota formula, including weight, within the you know, uh, uh, regional trade and all the type of thing. Uh, until uh, uh, sometime there was also what they call variability. And variability was specifically introduced in the quota formula of the IMF to represent actually to favor borrowing countries. Unfortunately, at some point, there was some uh, discussion that it had to be removed. And of course, that is not really in our, our benefits. Mm. So that's, a, that's another thing. And uh, I think what it means is what, like right now, when we talked about quota reform, we're talking about as uh, Mavis was putting it earlier, it's a, it's a, it's a geopolitical sort of um, uh, uh, um, uh, discussion. Um, when we were at the board, um, there are basically two type of um, shareholders that, uh, that work together. There was, of course, on one hand, you have the advanced economies, you have, of course, the US and the EU and others. On the other hand, you have the developing countries. At that time, we used to call them the G11. So there was the BRICS countries and, of course, African countries and others. Why? Because when you fight a battle or when you're trying to achieve something, you want to actually make a coalition with those who actually have similar interests. And, uh, of course, as uh, African executive directors, we tended to have the same sort of um, uh, claims as uh, other emerging market and developing countries. So we used to have that G11 uh, grouping that used to meet regularly to see how we could coordinate our position when it came to uh, quota reform. And we used even sometimes to issue what we call joint statements. So when the board has, when the board happened, uh, we would um, sort of um, get together and meet. So all of that to give you just the context before I respond. I think the, 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 the key message that I would say is Quota reform is a political <coughs> issue, and most likely the solution would be political. Um, yes, there are some technicalities that needs to be discussed. What's, uh, what should be the right variable in the quota formula? What should be the weight? What should be all of those things? But that's so technical because that, you know, those technical sort of consideration are meant to uh, sort of um, uh, uh, respond to a political sort of um, uh, guidance or, or, uh, 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 or measure or options. Uh, and that's, that's where the issue is. Uh, I think you mentioned it uh, earlier that uh, the U US has a veto. Uh, it's, um, maybe th that I need to qualify it a little bit. Yes, the US has, uh, in terms of voting power, more than 16%. And at the IMF executive board, all the major decisions are usually taken at the 85% majority, which means that, of course, if the US doesn't agree, nothing happens. But what happened, and that's where I'm clarifying it, is there is also an effort to take decision um, by consensus. What it means is, yes, sometimes most of the decision, when it's, let's say, it comes to lending to a country or those type of things, we don't require 85% majority. It's just a simple majority. And I think where it happened, the board is not even counting. I have never been to a board meeting where we resorted to take doing votes to make a, a, to take a decision. We tend to try to, you know, the 24 country, uh, executive directors try to uh, discuss and see what's the best and what's the middle ground that we can agree to and then uh, take a decision. Unfortunately, on the quota reform, there has not been so far any major consensus since uh, of course there is that uh, great power competition among the you know us the china and others why right? because the imf is supposed to be a rules-based institution and it, for long it has said that uh, if you have this economic sort of uh, um, uh, important power you're, it's going to be reflected into your 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 quota unfortunately china has that but unfortunately right now China, what? China is a 19 trillion economy. The US is the 26th. 
Um, the US has 16% uh, voting power, China has 6%. It's not supposed to be that way. China is supposed to be actually much closer to, 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 to the US, but unfortunately, it's not the case. China is right now has a voting power that is lower than uh, Japan. And Japan is, everyone knows that Japan is uh, the third economy. So all of that, why? Because there is some sort of, um, uh, there are some problems into uh, agreeing on how we should move forward in terms of um, reforming uh, the quota system at the IMF. And that, my sense is, and my experience tells me that uh, it's not going to be overcome so long as there is no political sort of uh, consensus. It's not going to be uh, at the board of the IMF that the solution is going to come. It's not uh, going to be, uh, you know, uh, at the IMFC. It's going to be at the political level. And for that, where I think, uh, you know, organization that are around here can really, really, really push is by making sure that this discussion is really sort of um, push in the public domain and making sure that, of course, the um, uh, political authorities are very much aware of the urgency of making sure that uh, this is, because this has a lot of implication for us as Africa, right? Because, uh, you know, we used to fight as executive director for our countries to have more access to IMF resources. And sometimes it was kind of frustrating because even if you do so and the IMF say, okay, let's raise the uh, access limit to 100% like uh, for um, emerging uh, financing. Well, you take a country like a, a Central African Republic, this quota is so, so insignificant that, uh, you know, even those was 100% of quota is not really very much, mm -hmm. it sort of solve much problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those are the implications that we are facing. That's one. Another implication is, yes, as executive director, I used to represent 23 African countries that was taken together was less than 2% of voting power. Of course, the only way I could have been sort of um, uh, uh, effective was to find a way to build coalition around us so that we can have our main sort of priority um, uh, position being shared by the majority. And that's the only way you can actually move forward. And that's not necessarily bad because that's how it works in a board. But I think in some situation, I think you want to have a situation, a country where, um, I'm sorry, an organization that is much more fair in terms of things. Now, one last, and I'm going to finish there. I think we always tend to say, okay, maybe we need to go, uh, uh, you know, down the road of the UN, one country, one board. We also have to think about the shortcoming of the UN uh, system uh, in terms of um, mobilizing resources, in terms of uh, decision making, in terms of actually the ability, the proneness to really being, uh, uh, you know, um, um, constrained in a, in a major decision. I, I think that's also a balance that has to be taken. Up. No matter what we say, I think that the IMF things get done, things move apart from, of course, the governance issues. Uh, and of course, we are not happy because uh, I think I, I, African countries are not getting as much as they wanted to. And that's a constant battle. Uh, but I think uh, the solution would have to come from this uh, politics. But so, uh, to answer, to uh, ask her last question again. So how can we improve the, uh, the way the IMF works with, uh, with uh, their partner countries in terms of, so they said that, I think maybe she was saying that there was sort of bad practice on the IMF side in terms of uh, policy that they were putting forward. So how can we have a better working relationship? Well, uh, you have to remember that the 24 of the, um, executive directors that the IMF represent the 190 members of the IMF. So what, uh, mean, what it means is if you are able to have consensus capital level, you know that the IMF is going to be able, is going to be forced to follow what the, guide, the board guidance that it receives. So what's the best way? And, uh, you know, there are many ways to improve the, rela the, the relation between the IMF and our countries. First of all, is at the board level to make sure that, you know, the boards agree on a um, so number of uh, sort of, um, uh, on uh, some consensus, on consensus, how do you say? Um, yeah, principles. And that guys IMF work into the in in our countries. I think that's the first the first stage. The second stage is the board itself to does its job in terms of uh, holding the IMF management and the staff accountable. That's an issue there because it's, I think it's the nature of the governance system at the IMF that also make it a lot uh, more difficult to achieve that. Why? Because well, the board, the twenty four members, their chair is the IMF managing director, and the IMF managing director is the chief of the staff. Of course, there is, of course, some synergy between the managing director and the staff. But there is, you know, sometimes when you come as executive board members, you tend to be looked at as, a, <laughs> I would not say an adversary, but in some ways, I think the relation might not be actually extremely fluid between the board and the staff and management. So I think that's where also the issue is. Um, yes, the managing director is the chair, 
but I think the board of the IMF has to find a way to keep them very much in check uh, by having very strong sort of uh, performance um, uh, um, metrics that uh, they would have to follow. They are doing it now, but maybe it's not uh, um, uh, effective enough for uh, having uh, you know that uh, uh, that type of uh, fluid relation between the IMF and staff and uh, and the countries. One last thing, also, I think we also have to look at from our side what is it that we should do at the country level to build our capacities to negotiate better with the IMF staff. Um, you know, uh, I have been to tens or even maybe hundreds of missions with the IMF staff in our, some of our countries. And believe me, I think some, in some cases there are a lot of uh, capacities and that you can understand if you take a, for instance a small fragile state with limited capacity uh, with uh, you know a high turnover it's very difficult for them to really have in ministries and central banks you know the capacity that they need to really sort of uh, negotiate with IMF stuff in those countries they tend to take the IMF stuff as being the you know the the gods, right? Whatever they say, that's uh, what we need to implement because they don't have the capacity. But I think the, uh, so it means capacity development and capacity building in those countries. But in other major countries also, I think uh, that's the issue is not about capacity, it's sometimes also about um, political uh, commitment. Because whatever you may say, sometimes the IMF is used as a, uh, you know, an excuse for, uh, or, you know, for it's a political sort of, um, uh, how do you it's say? It's a game. Uh, it's a game, <laughs> it's a game yeah, right? Because some, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a minister of finance. Uh, you know, I, I, I have to take some tough decision. Well, I would blame the IMF and, of course, mm -hmm. make sure that the, my, my, uh, my population is um, uh, very much understand. What I'm saying is, I think it's a, ma it's a combination of capacity and a combination of uh, political commitment and political will that actually make it also difficult to really um, uh, improve the relation between the IMF and the, and the, and the staff and the countries. We're going to take a question here and two from online if there are any. So uh, we'll start. Okay, we'll take two questions here and then two online. Thanks. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emma Bergeser. I'm with Krishna, based in London. Um, thanks so much for the conversation and the debate. Um, I followed, I've been following IMF quota reform very closely for a while now, so I really appreciate the discussion. And it's one of those areas where there's such a lack of transparency and accountability in general. And so I really just appreciate, you know, the fact that we're having these debates here is so important. So, so I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I think I just, I, you know, as we're trying to have you know, this discussion about what's realistic and what's not and how to position ourselves and what's not. I think one of the things we can do as a society is reframing some of the discussion because we started this um, panel, right, with the, the premise that we have a new commitment or it's actually this ask for proposals for redistribution of the IMF by June 2025, right? But I would actually suggest that we, we start at a slightly different point, which is that commitment was made at the end of the 16th quota reform, right? When the other outcome of that 16th was that the members did absolutely everything they could mm -hmm. to not <laughs> redistribute an inch. They could have done it at the 16th. They said they would. They also promised they would do quota formula changes for the 16th. And they told us all very, very clearly that they're not going to do it. They threw the formula out the door. They that they designed themselves. You know, they um, didn't even do ad hoc arrangements. Brazil was fighting until seven a.m. You know, for even tiny, tiny, tiny adjustments for the for those countries that were least represented, and they said no. So I think we, you know, we we are being told very clearly by the major members of the fund you know where they stand on these things and and that that promise that they would do it for the 16th wasn't just there for the last two years right it's there for the last 10 years i just went back in 2002 the monterey consensus you know we have agreement there from 200 governments that yes the ifi should have a more representative system right so they've been promising this to us this ifi reform imf governance reform for a very long time and very much not delivering. And so I, this is a bit of a wake up of, you know, let's face that head on. Even now, right this week, we have seen the MD reappointed without any discussion 
one woman race because of the same arrangements, right? The, the gentleman's arrangement between the US and Europe. So let's like wake up and pay attention that they're, they're being very loud and telling us very clearly where they stand on these things. And so, um, and, and also just to point out that when we talk about even just applying the current formula, what they will, in, in the interest of African countries, in the interest of the, the, the top poorest, most uh, least represented countries, they'll tell us actually those countries are already overrepresented because we are artificially holding their shares up because they have that agreement, right? That um, they protect some of the, the smallest voice. So technically that's already going through ad hoc arrangements. <laughs> and so, so I think we, we need to like take a few steps back and ask, you know, when we talk about what's a fair formula, like what, what do we mean by that? And, you know, what does fair mean? And I, I you know, we, I, we should be very clear, right? That the formula was all, always created from the beginning at knowing what the outcomes were that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And then they, they figured out the formula mm -hmm. of, uh, based on that, right? Um, so so I, I appreciate the approach you're trying to take exactly. in terms of, um, you know, saying what you want first, African shares doubled, and then figuring out the formula to fit that. Um, but yeah, let's do that in a way that really recognizes what they're loudly telling us at the moment, right? I mean, the proposals right now from the US are yes, to change the formula, but to increase their vote. That's, that's what they're proposing, right? So uh, my question <laughs> is maybe especially to, to Jason, so, you know, this year we have the G20 led by Brazil where they are very clearly putting global governance reform, including IMF photo reform, like on the table, right? Summit of the future, it's also there and on the agenda of the UNSG. Then next year, we have the IMF quota moment, World Bank shareholding review, and of course, the fourth financing for development conference. And so all these things coming together, these very high level discussions on global governance reform, you know, what, what can we actually expect in the and, and what do you think we should be doing with all of these moments? to get us into a place, I think, where we're talking much more about moving away from quota-based systems in the first place, uh, or those institutions that will stay that way, um, and not just for that, um, you know, fighting for that continued tiny vote share that isn't going to really change the, the dynamic. So, Jason, I'd be really interested in your view on that. Thanks. Thanks, okay. everyone. So, summary of that was reframing the discussion, and then uh, what, can, what should we be looking forward to 2025 or how should we be looking forward to it in terms of uh, shaping our agenda? Uh, we'll take another question here, and then we'll take two from uh, online, and then we'll have to close it because I've got a flight to catch. I'll be actually here to pass over the director of the University Center for Policy Research. Thank you all for the presentation. It's a really fascinating discussion. Thank you both for your time and your insights from inside the IMF. Um, I promise to be short. Um, Paolo, you said at one point, um, we've given too much importance sometimes to the IMF process and sucked all of the air out of the room and be wasting our time on processes that we can't really control. Jason, you then pointed to the UN several times as an example of a place where progress has been made, held it up as a standard, essentially. And yet we heard mo a moment ago that we shouldn't also hold it perhaps the UN and the one country, one vote model up as an effective decision making um, uh, model. And so it brings me to the question, what can we achieve through the practice of the future? I mentioned the Secretary General's been very bold in his ambition of pointing out this moment in September that could potentially deliver change. Uh, and yet I personally have a bit of skepticism about what can actually be, be delivered in New York, going along the lines of the comments that were made. So I would really like to, to hear what you think the UN in this moment, in five months, in the current geopolitical context, can actually deliver. And I want to put two things to you. First, in the latest Pact for the Future negotiation document, the G77 put forward a proposal that a technical mechanism be established, I'm just going to read very quickly, a technical mechanism be established to advise on the most effective way that the participation of developing countries could be broadened and strengthened in international economic governance institutions, specifically looking at quota reform. So the G77 is calling for the creation of a mechanism at the UN to advise within the next year on quota reform. Do you think, it's already been opposed by several 
But do you think such a mechanism could be beneficial? Do you think uh, this is something that the after debater, for example, will fight for? And can it have a meaningful impact on this discussion? Second, we talked about basic votes, and I, I've read some of your writing, it's uh, very helpful. Uh, we know that basic votes have decreased over time. There have been calls uh, to double the current basic votes. Do you see that as an effective way of addressing voice and power within the IMF? And do you see any government championing that as a solution at this moment? Thank you. Do you have questions online or? Okay, so I think the first one was to Jason in terms of uh, reframing the discussion and uh, the, our approach towards the upcoming events, G20 in Brazil, G20 in South Africa, uh, Finance for Development Forum, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, um, Emma, thank you for the question. I think this is a very pivotal moment um, for Africa, but also more broadly, the, the Global South. Um, if you look at the path towards the fourth development conference in Spain next year, we've got no, no, more than, no less than 10 African countries that are either chairing, co-chairing, uh, facilitating, co-facilitating different um, international thematic uh, areas with regard to global economic governance uh, in, in, on the track on finance for development. So there's a huge opportunity um, that, that is before us if, if we genuinely want to put uh, Africa on the map in terms of uh, rulemaking uh, over the next generation or the next sort of uh, decade or so of, of financial development, which includes reforming of the global financial architecture. And I think within sort of dovetailing what David said, you know, in, infusing some of what that might actually mean for uh, existing IFIs, parallel tracks that, uh, that Paolo has mentioned. Um, I think it's extremely important that uh, Brazil has taken the, 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 the mantle here um, and we'll hand it over to South Africa in a, in a very progressive and meaningful way in, 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 on many things that have uh, had genuinely stalled uh, when it comes to global economic governance uh, reform. Um, what I would caution is um, the stuff that's happening on, and you, I think you'd expect me to caution, on the summit of the future. I think member states um, in New York have openly said, particularly from the global south, that they do not see the value of this summit because it seems to be regurgitating things that are already known. There's nothing new, um, per se, that's coming out of the sun of the future. And, and I, you know, many of us in civil society tend to agree with that. And therefore, I think the, the work that's being done by Brazil through the G20, the preparations towards the fourth financial development um, in Spain next year become very critical moments uh, for where the discussion on global economic governance um, is going to go for. I want to qualify, I think, the point that the Dauda made here around, I don't think he said it's an ineffective thing to do. I think he said, it's a, you know, he, on the voice, I think he said it's, it's fraught with some of the inefficiencies of operations, um, which, doesn't, which is totally different from one country, one voice. Um, so perhaps, maybe if there were investments in the UN and you know, in this wonderful land where we're sitting, uh, they would pay up some of the money that they're supposed to. Perhaps some of that, those operational inefficiencies might be actually uh, overcome. Um, but I think the premise, if we're talking about global economic governance, um, really one country, one vote is perhaps the most fairest uh, uh, dispensation that we could think about. Um, could we see a scenario where the United Nations has an, an overarching um, role and view on, on how a global economic governance uh, works? I don't see that as being something that's so out there and uh, it's having its implementing agencies uh, and technical advisory institutions uh, to do that uh, but the direction coming from a, you know a governance structure where uh, particularly countries of the global south and in Africa specifically have an equal say in how decisions are being made I think that is not a scenario that's too far beyond us given the direction um, that, that we're moving with the with the tax convention. And this is why it's extremely important that we continue to support that kind of process in democratizing how global economic governance um, it, it is being done. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, if I may add something and just bring a little bit of nuance on the, the process around the pact uh, for the future. Um, we mentioned, well, I mentioned earlier the issue of uh, um, structural adjustment programs 
that was the way to go in African countries, late 90s, early 2000s. What put an end to it? What put an end to this? National development plans. And there was nothing re re revolutionary in national development plans, but the fact that countries would say, this is our priorities. These are our priorities. And this is how we're going to organize ourselves and organize the support from outside to reach what we want to reach as an objective for our country. So I think that the fact, the, the fact for the future also has merit. Um, we were, uh, Mavis asked us about uh, uh, the, um, the GDP and the fact that it's not serving African economies. It's outdated. It is outdated. It's not taking into consideration um, domestic work. It's not taking into consideration non-formal economy or informal economy, the way you want to put it. It's not taking into consideration the impact on the environment. And one of the pillars of the Pact for the Future is actually the discussion uh, around an indicator that is beyond GDP. So there's many issues that are coming together as uh, being identified by the UNSG as uh, uh, crucial for the future. Um, and I think it has merit for us to also contribute to the process. And I, I hope that most of us are going to contribute to the Nairobi conference and we'll be happy to, to host you in May in Nairobi around the discussions for the Pact for the, fu for the, the, Pact for the Future. Yeah. One question was directed at you, was it because of the UN and the uh, basic vote, et cetera? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it goes back to what you're asking about uh, geopolitical nature of what we are doing. And, and, and it's, it's really, we have an obligation to provide a out of the box thinking to our leaders. Because mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it goes back to the leader, Senegal just had a, yeah. a new president, he's 44 years yeah. old, uh, with a lot of expectations. You know, at, at this point, the idea would be how to kind of provide to him a framework in which he will focus on things that he has internally, that get him done, rather than getting him into flying left and right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and others, yeah. for things that he will not change. So, and because it's always the political yeah. principle mm -hmm. on this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Nigeria, the president took over the next day, made a speech, he decided to yeah. change all this, uh, you know, and the subsidies. How much Nigeria now is making every month? It didn't need the IMF program for that. Yeah. Because the IMF program will have probably piggyback many other things that we don't it doesn't need. Mm -hmm. But it was major. You know, we have a countries that we are going, you know, I look at one country, maybe so 1.67 million people. We have 10, 15 embassies, MPs, you know, like many other African countries. So I, I'm saying that not in terms of, you know, mm. I, I think it's important at this point for, for in this process to continue to move it. And I think we have experts like you and others to move that agenda. But let's start also thinking about the parallel track, not as an opposition to the first track, <laughs> but as something that enables us to generate resources for things that has impact in our countries without going to the IMF. Because as the other say, mm -hmm. the quota to do what? But $30 million plus, more maybe, and a country like mine, if I change it, maybe $50 million. That $50 million, I have it with fishing license. If I decide to tell the European Union that I don't want to sell you the license the way I do. So I think it's an out of the box process that we need. But if we do a parallel, you will be surprised by the amount of resources that we will mobilize to create institutions that will be complement to that. Mm -hmm. I give the example of the one, uh, the uh, Africa Finance Corporation. It was $1 billion for, 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 from Nigeria. That $1 billion that they were burning in, 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 in several other things. You know? So let's keep that track. If we do that track and strengthen the capacity of our countries, you will be amazed by the, the damage that an IMF staff of some of the IMF staff who is arrogant, and not all of them. Again, it's the Pareto principle. It's a 20% of those guys that arrive. You know, they used to go on private plane in visiting some of the countries in the past. It doesn't happen anymore. And still, I think I need this. So 
uh, it used to be first class, you know, until Anidi saw a, a, a secretary from uh, Anidi <laughs> office being in the first class. I think and said, what the hell is this? You know, so I think there are changes. That organization in itself is, is, is changing and it's not going to go fast track because let's understand, I mean, for America, I don't see a leader who take the risk to change yeah. this rule of the game within diamond. You know, and it will, it will have a serious problem with the Congress. So let's understand that. You know, so while we do that, we do that, we, we create the parallel track, complement that, we strengthen the capacity of our country so we can negotiate with a, st a team from the IMF, you know, to, pro to present proper proposal. Because some of the programs sometimes need some social engineering that an IMF staff mm -hmm. is not aware of because it doesn't know the country. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we end up proposing something would be disastrous to the country without knowing that this will dislodge the cohesion of a, of a, of a country. So it's a conclusion that I wanted to provide for this. Perfect. I don't have a private jet, so uh, mm -hmm. he's not waiting for me. I've got to go to him. But uh, we're going to take one, one point, then I'm going to do a quick summary of what I took home. Not that it matters to you guys. Uh, and then Hannah Ryder, uh, uh, and then Hannah Ryder will make the closing remarks. I don't know if uh, Patrick wants to say a few words as well, but I think that someone wants to make a comment there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm Hannah Sirutana from the Brentwoods Project. Um, so yeah, the quota reform is fundamentally a political issue. We all know that, um, and the lack of realignment is reflected in the fact that there are too many. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's too many divergent interests. Um, the way to achieve this is to have significant political kind of pressure to pressure the US to make a change. And that's not there. Like it's not coming from BRICS because they themselves have diverging interests. Some of the countries are underrepresented, some of the countries are overrepresented. Uh, we know that China uh, is asking for like a small increase, like behind closed doors. I've heard that. Maybe because with that increase, they're thinking they're trying to get the veto power like for the whole BRICS countries, we don't know. Um, we know what the US is advocating for and so on and so forth. Um, so basically, I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts from the panelists. What do you think should be Africa's uh, position in kind of this forming alliances to try to exert some sort of influence to hopefully shift the needle a little bit? Thank you. But I'm going to be very uh, quick, and I'm also going to respond to the question about uh, uh, the UN proposal. So I, I won't be long. Uh, what the uh, what the what Africa should do is easy. I think you have to be pragmatic when you negotiate in a situation where you have various sort of interests. What matters is, of course, your to push you for your interests. So. Uh, you need to, first of all, of course, make sure that the U.S. is on board. When we are talking about IMF, we need to put a reform because otherwise nothing happens. Because they statutorily, legally, um, you know, they have that veto and you have to make sure that you discuss with them so that is something that happens. But at the same time, you also have to build your coalition with others, like the, like the China, like the BRICS, right? Because simply we do have the same sort of um, uh, uh, um, uh, interest in to making sure that the quota reform happen. Uh, in uh, you know in our favor, so that's what you need to do. Uh, I, I don't don't think actually it is in the in Africa's interest to take side. Uh, what matters is you keep strengthening your relation with your traditional partners and also with your new partners. And I think that's one. And one last thing, and quickly, I think on the question about what the UN is proposing uh, to set up a. Um, uh, and, and working group and uh, make some proposals. Well, the reality is the UN has already made uh, several recommendations for the reform of uh, governance at the IMF. The, the UN has uh, recently come up with a brief on the reform of the global financial architecture. And in that brief, they're proposing that the IMF should be now in, uh, sort of going for double majority uh, in, in decision making. They're also proposing that actually IMF lending has to be on a need basis and not based on quota. All of those things. The reality is no one is listening to the UN, unfortunately. Because why? Because there is, I think, um, this this gap, the, uh, you know, between the UN and the IMF. Um, I was um, uh, in charge of uh, the board committee at the IMF, um, tasked with uh, strengthening the relation between the IMF and the UN. We don't have much relation apart from going to the summit on uh, financing for development once a year in uh, at, in New York meeting the UN ambassadors there, having a discussion, and then that's it. Nothing sort of uh, happened in terms of follow. I think that's where the, uh, the, the gap is. And we need to make sure that these institutions speak and work together. 
and actually have formal sort of uh, engagement processes that leads to some you know, a meaningful exchange of ideas. And I think when we do that, if the UN come with some ideas, maybe it isn't going to be likely to be implemented. But right now, if they come up with this new working group, my chances, my sense, my sense is they will come up with a new report, just like the UN brief, that is going to be just ignored. Yeah, I just want to say that exactly what I said on like the UN IMF relationship. It's that way by design. And it's by design because, you know, the countries that hold the power at the IMF you know, don't want to give that power up. So why would they go there and like be in a more democratic forum and negotiate? And I think it goes back to the question that was asked like before on accountability and bringing up the example of Ghana. It's like, I would say that from a political economy perspective, the IMF has been very accountable to its large shareholders and their interests because it's like, there's a close relationship, you know, US treasury is like running the show. US treasury has a very close relationship with the financial industry. And the IMF's accountability has been very good on enforcing that, you know, creditors get paid. And that's what the repeated like IMF programs have done. So it's like it's been accountable, very accountable to that, but not to, you know, what's happening in the borrowing countries. Fantastic. This is part of, and let me wrap this into closing remarks as well, because I think this is part of the, the, the exercise, right, which is number one, develop a position, or at least develop some options for a position. And I think, you know, having been an ex-civil servant and working with, with countries that do develop positions and they have their top lines and their red lines, etc., and you circulate those positions, and I'm not saying that our countries don't do that, but I think there is an opportunity to do that and to do it collectively. That's something we do at Development Reimagined in China, for example, supporting the African ambassadors in China to link into these positions and then work and influence and work with China as governments, because that's what they're, that's what they're there to do. And similarly, they do that in the UK eventually and the US and they can do that. So I think it's yeah. convening um, those conversations, making sure that there's understanding of these positions and, and again, and it's, it's very difficult to do at the capital level because at capital, countries are concerned with what's happening domestically. They're not necessarily, you know, and yes, look, Mavis, you're talking about Ghana going to the IMF 17 times. Well, in total, African countries have gone to the IMF 607 times over its lifetime, yeah? And Ghana's not the worst <laughs> in terms of going, but partly the reason why we're doing that is because we do have such small ability we have to keep going back and we have these repayment periods we don't influence and so this is the point about having a greater share imf having a greater share in the voting is not is not just to do that but it's to be able to shape the organization and to shape the way that africa engages with the organization in future it's not to say that that's going to solve everything it's not going to mean that we don't still not vote in the actual boards but it's to say that we might, if we have a stronger share, have a bit more opportunity for putting forward our positions on these issues. Simple as that. So I want to say thank you to everybody for joining us and thank you to Omar for moderating us so well, despite the fact that you've got to rush off for your flight. <laughs> and thank you again to Boston University and, uh, and to um, and Oxfam for hosting us and to our great panelists for joining us, despite the very, very busy schedule that you all have. I'll, I'll make a few closing remarks if, you, if I may. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I didn't think I could uh, post a two-hour conversation around reimagining the IMF quota system. But obviously, it's got far-reaching uh, implications, and uh, and it's a discussion that's more far, well, much beyond the IMF, and uh, it's more about uh, our decision making and being at the table. But ultimately, I think in terms of the take home that I that I've taken home mm -hmm. is we need to have a clear and simple objective that we can then all align behind and align to. Uh, but that also requires political leadership. So we may uh, we need to see who, who's, who's that political leader is going to take that capacity at a country level. So preparedness and that the political will to uh, to get to where we want to. 
but at the same time, we need to de de develop parallel tracks, and there are alternatives, and the more alternatives there are, the stronger our bargaining position. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, we need to know what right, the, the right buttons to push. So maybe it's at an ambassador level that we've just mentioned, is it at Congress level that we need to do some of the lobbying, and, uh, and ultimately also uh, amongst ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists, Jason, Patti, Lara, Barma, and uh, Hannah Ryder. Thank you.